Hi, welcome back to America's Next Top Nightmare. I'm your host, Blair White, and we have a lot to talk about. The most important of the things that we have to talk about, I'll make it super brief, is a very quick apology for the podcast channel being less than active. It seems like whenever I'm super active on my main channel, the podcast channel suffers, and when I'm super active on my podcast channel, the main channel suffers, I'm trying to get it together, trying to get everything going all at once. However, um, it's not entirely my fault. We had... Um, some arrangements made with the network that we uh, were working with for the podcast. Some things are different now. Everything's cool with that, but it's different. So that took a second. And then also, I unfortunately had a death in the family. And so I had to, you know, travel because of that, obviously, and, you know, deal with family things. And that's just been a lot. Uh, but she's risen. She's back. And we're going to get into it. So the first thing. Pray for me. I forgot the demented things we cover on this podcast channel and demented people. James Charles would like to be uncanceled, please. No. No, no. Uh, request denied. Okay. Back it on up. Get out. Get in your car. I'm sure it's a very nice car. Zip down the hill. It's not going to happen. Here's where everyone says Blair, I thought you were against cancel culture. Oh. I'm sorry. Do you think predators shouldn't be canceled? Do you think they're not exceptions to every rule? Right. Uh, predators should be canceled. I don't consider that under the falling under the umbrella of cancel culture, right? Cancel culture is like this hoe tweeted something, you know, in 2011 and all of a sudden is having their life ruined about it, right? That, that's, that's what that is. Consequences for being a child predator, on the other hand, like James cracked out looking Charles, like James permanently sounds like he's underwater, Charles, you've heard the voice. It's giving when you're underwater and you try to talk, yeah, that. Um, <laughs> so this is his article. James Charles would like to be uncanceled, please. This is a fluff, a fluff piece by Cosmopolitan, which... Not surprising that they're doing that because I seem to remember Cosmopolitan uh, covering a few groomy stories throughout the years. Uh, but anyways, more than two years after allegations of sexual impropriety sent the superstar beauty YouTuber into influencer purgatory, he's hoping to relaunch himself and his brand. Oh, of course, he's selling a product. Right. Uh, with the help of a new makeup line. In a wide-ranging interview with Cosmopolitan, Charles talks about effing up and trying to move on. Moving on would be moving on from public life because it's very much your public life that has given you access to underage boys. And if we need to remind you guys on some of these disgusting allegations, not even allegations, I mean, some of them he's admitted to, right? James has admitted to texting underage boys repeatedly. One as young as 15 who claims that he told James his age and James continued talking to him 15 wow I am disgusted is this Colleen Ballinger's cousin uh I think so there's a tweet from James saying I'll put it up on the screen something along the lines of you guys don't understand that minor that Colleen sent the panties to was begging her to do it for years as if that's some sort of excuse or justification uh, for sending a child panties. So this article, James Charles' own brother doesn't talk to him. Wow. I mean, that kind of tells you something, right? It's like family. One thing about family is like they will they will stick with their, their F-ups of the family, right? There are people who, you know, go to jail for, you know, shooting people and like you just crazy stuff and their family sticks by them. So if your own brother ain't talking to you because of that, Hi. I think that says something, right? And it's so funny because one of the things about Mr. James Charles is y'all know back in like, I don't know, 2018, 2019, maybe a little bit into 2020, when I was sort of like in the mix with like a lot of the YouTubers in a certain genre, like the Shane Dawson's, the Trisha Paytas's, the James Charles, all of that ended up in flames. And who knows where any of them are. I mean, I see James Charles is here trying to 
you know, crawl his way back from hell, go back. Uh, but one of the things that happened during that time was, you know, these people would, and also I'll keep this a little vague, but you know, people would send you certain receipts, right? And so I've known for a long time and people have known for a long time, even before it came out that James was a predator, that he was doing this fuck shit. And from what I've heard, which I believe to be very credible because I was shown receipts of it and what I consider to be evidence is that y'all don't know the half of the James Charles allegations. Oh, you think him DMing underage boys is like the worst of it? Nuts. Like an actual demon. Um, And it's crazy because everyone questions like, you know, how are you supposed to spot like, you know, someone who's a bad person. You just don't know until they act on it. And it's like, you can look at him and tell he's a demon. The spirit of the demon is on his face and his mannerisms and his body. Like this is, you know, he reminds me of like the Powerpuff Girls, the devil demon, the gay devil, the gay demon. Right. Uh, so James request denied and don't bother coming back, back around here. Bitch. I'm desperate. So here's a topic that's going to get me even angrier than um, remembering what James Charles' face looks like and voice sounds like, which I have to say was a great pregame for how mad I'm going to get in this segment. Nice and all fired up talking about that gay devil. Now let's talk about the globalist devils. Let's talk about the fact that COVID mandates are coming back. Y'all know, I'm one of the few, and I will say this, I'm one of the few commentators on the right that stuck with talking about the travesty of 2020 and lockdowns and COVID and all that for years. Even like when people forgot about it, for whatever reason, it seems like the entirety of the right, once Dylan Mulvaney uploaded his first TikTok, completely forgot about the important conversations that were happening based around freedom the power of government, tyranny, you know, those things that are like the foundational bedrock of like conservatism and being on the right, those important conversations, they were all dropped the moment Dylan Mulvaney got on TikTok. And for the past two years, we've only been talking about Dylan Mulvaney. I say we, cause of course I've talked about Dylan Mulvaney, but I also, that's my lane. I'm trans. Hi, I'm the T. I can talk about it. If every video I uploaded was about Dylan Mulvaney, that would be in my lane. And yet and still, I've talked about him less than almost anyone else. But I'm getting off on a tangent. The point is what I'm trying to say is it seems as if we all lived through lockdowns, uh, the collective trauma of 2020, 2021, and the important conversations about how to you know, not let the government do that again, not stamp on constitutional rights again, not shut the country down and destroy everyone's mental health again. Those conversations just stopped once everything opened back up. Um, nothing really communicates how useless the Republican Party is based on the fact that now there's articles coming up like COVID mandates coming back, COVID mandates on flights coming soon, surge, you know, start talking about locking down again. And everyone on the right is like, oh my God, can you believe they're talking about COVID again? Can you believe they're going to lock us down again? Yeah, that's actually what happens. Um, when you allow them to do that, they did it once. Why would they not do it again? What have you guys done for the past few years to ensure that they don't do it again? Nothing. Yeah. That's what's the point of voting anymore. I don't know. I'm feeling very politically homeless about this whole thing, but anyways, so this all started <laughs> amazingly with Alex Jones, um, saying that TSA informants were giving him a heads up that COVID mandates are coming back. And, uh, Amazingly, one day later, one day later, there's articles everywhere about how it's coming back and it's confirmed and, you know, colleges and studios in Hollywood and whatever. Y'all can give Alex Jones his flowers anytime. Let's watch that, though, and then we'll get back to this. Ladies and gentlemen, I got a call yesterday. An individual was in town and they wanted to meet with me that I know well. And they are a high-level manager in the TSA. They said, you got to warn people. Tuesday, we got called in, the managers, 
and told that by the middle of September, that the new policy is being written, that this is done, they were told this is happening, this is not hypothetical, you will all have to wear masks again, and so will airport employees. They were told, we expect by December a return to the full COVID protocol of 2020-2021. So these people are returning. You think they're not coming back? Watch this. Masking is not an option. The only thing that you're making optional is whether or not disabled people and immunocompromised people get to live. That is the option that you're making. And you are consistently choosing your own comfort over marginalized people's lives. And you know what that is? That's white supremacy in action. Wow. Clap if you care. All right, let's move on. First of all, y'all will call anything white supremacy. I'm pretty sure y'all could look at an orange piece of paper and find a way to say that that is white supremacy. Right? So we'll even just set that to the side for a second and get to arguably, I guess it's up in the air, the more dimension part of what you said. You, <laughs> I don't even know what to call you. Commie, communist, busybody, piece of shit. Uh, choosing your own comfort. Yeah, yeah, I choose me. Letting y'all know that now, public service announcement, Blair will be choosing her when the rest of the world decides to lock down. Blair will be choosing her. Blair will be doing what she wants to do, right? I have one life to live. Y'all took a lot of my time with all this shit last time. Not going to happen again. No, no. If you're immunocompromised, if you are at higher risk, guess whose responsibility that is? isn't mine does that sound cold does that sound cruel sure is life fair no life is not fair and i would never go out of my way to do anything to harm anyone but if you are someone who can't step outside without getting sick that is a problem that is always going to exist for you whether or not we're you know having government mandates about it or not it it I feel empathy for you and I am so sorry that that has happened to you, whatever has caused you to have that state or that condition, genuinely. That's not my fault. That's not on me to protect you, right? And the amount of lies that were told during that time, get the shot. It's not for you. It's for other people. Oh, and then it comes out, you know, that doesn't actually stop transmission, but we just had billions of people take it all in one fell swoop telling them that it would, right? Same goes with the mask. If it works, it'll work on your face. And I am so happy for you. I will not be putting it on. Do we gotta talk about how wearing dirty masks, which I saw a lot of y'all. I saw, I was in an airport. I saw a man blow his nose inside the mask and keep the mask on. I will not be doing that to myself. No, no. So know that, commies. I am just going to make it very clear now. I will not be complying with a single COVID mandate. That means masks. That means whatever shot that they've convinced you is normal to receive at McDonald's, Rite Aid, Burger King, right? That they've convinced you the second it comes out within seconds, it's ready to take. Um, no, I won't be doing that. That includes lockdowns. That includes staying in my house and letting my mental health deteriorate for the sake of your feelings. No, no. See, this is what y'all don't get. <laughs> Let's be real, Karen. And let's be really real because a lot of you are Karens without even knowing it. A lot of y'all will go and talk about how someone is a Karen because they complained at, you know, Target. Maybe, you know, the employees pissed her off. Now she's talking to the manager, right? 
a lot of y'all will call someone a Karen with a quickness for complaining to the manager, but then proceed to police and mandate the lives of strangers. Emotionally, right? You use your emotions to bully and manage the lives and choices of free thinking other individual people. Disgusting. Disgusting. I will never understand how y'all don't consider people who go around screaming at people in the face to put a mask on. Those aren't Karens to you. That's the ultimate Karen to me. Ma'am, why do you think you have authority over me at all? Why do you think you can dictate what I do with my body, my life, my choices at all? Oh, my body, my choice, right? Right. So that was all bullshit. So yeah, I'm just making it very clear. You know, I don't really care. I don't really care how many of you guys are going to fall for it again. I don't really care how many of you guys are making choices about what you want to do. And you want to wear six face shields and a mask on top. You're free to do so. And not one ounce of me even was mad about that during the thick of the panini. I was like, okay, well, they do what they do. I just wish they would let me do what I do. Right? Right. Still America. Not China yet, bitch. And that's really the gag because a lot of y'all are fucking commies. A lot of y'all are fucking commies without knowing it. A lot of y'all are Karens without fucking knowing it. And they will reveal themselves once these mandates really come back in the thick of it. Because then y'all are going to start trying to control other people. Snitching to 911. Oh, Blair's having a house party next door. Oh, we need the feds to go in and raid people's businesses and shut down their livelihoods, destroy their families, and then offer them like $1,600 in a year for it, but then send billions and billions and billions to Ukraine. Right. So yeah, a just announcement, I will not be complying. And uh, you can call me a grandma killer right now. You can call me a bad person. You can call me anything that your, you know, little troglodyte brain finds comfort in saying and anything that lets you feel like you're taking back a little bit of control by not being able to control me because that's the fact. You can't control me. One thing that became very apparent to me during Miss Corona lockdowns, you know, the collectivist hellhole where everyone became a communist, uh, was that it empowered the losers of society, right? It empowered the people who have never had an ounce of power in their life. And it gave those people the ability to police others. It gave those people um, an authority role. So when they saw someone with, you know, maybe no mask on or a mask that they even felt was not, uh, you know, up to par with effectiveness, right? Like if you wore a mask that had like some bedazzle stuff on it or whatever, it was too thin, they would, they would get in your face about that. It gave those people carte blanche to harass people, to snitch on people, to be enraged about simple things. Like I remember tweeting that I was walking my dog and I got people sending me tweets like, really? You're going outside and people pe putting people's lives at risk? Grandma killer. So it gave those people power, the losers. I told the story about how when I was living in Hollywood, which was the worst place to live during the thick of Corona or the thin of Corona, was uh, I was entering the elevator in my apartment building and a man wearing, a grown man wearing a mask and a face shield physically put his hands on me, physically pushed me out of the elevator, screaming like a little bitch, screaming like I'm Osama bin Laden, like Hitler just walked in the elevator, right? And that was because his television told him that that was an acceptable way to behave, to physically put his hands on a woman to physically put his hands on anyone half his size screaming because they weren't wearing a mask. I'm going to do what I want. And that's just what that is. So I'm going to let it be known now. Okay. <sighs> wow. Speaking of things that are contagious, Miss Corona, his child and partner came out as transgender. 
Now, Rowan Jet Knox writes on the freedom of coming out as trans himself. So your wife's trans, your child's trans, and now whoop, you're trans. And some of y'all will really sit up here and say that there's no social contagion in regards to being trans, that there's just no social contagion. Well, you know, a lot of y'all are just very simple minded. A lot of y'all um, have like a very clear limit to the capabilities of thought that you have, right? There's clear borders. There's a board, like you can't think past here. So when you hear people talking about a social contagion, you get all up in your little fifis and you say, why are they saying trans is a social contagion in its entirety? Because y'all are black and white thinkers. So you think that by me saying that there's a social contagion in regards to being trans, that means I think trans is a social contagion always. No, it's something real. And it was real for people, a very small amount of people. And a social contagion came out of something very real. This is not a difficult concept. What's not clicking? What's not clicking? If y'all think there's no social contagion, I would love for you to answer in any type of coherent way how it's happening in families. You can have an entire family of trans people. Something that we, there is no evidence is genetic. And even if it was genetic, that doesn't explain two partners being trans who are not blood related. So what's really good? Is there no social contagion or are you a liar or blind who can't like look around and like observe what's happening and you see a story about an entire family of people coming out as trans and transitioning medically and you're like anyways there's no social contagion sure um no no this is demented. This is very demented. Even more demented is this old tweet from the same person who is this, the subject of this article. You're not going to believe this tweet. I live with two trans people. I interact with thousands of trans and non-binary people every day. I write and speak about trans issues. Have I looked deeply at my own gender identity as a result? Definitely. Have I ever felt that I'm trans? No. Trans isn't a social contagion. The very person who then comes out as trans. Let's see, uh, just three years later. A few moments later. One said it's not a social contagion, is now transitioning because his family is. Y'all really need to get it together in terms of not treating this trans shit like it's the same thing it was. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even really like five years ago. It's not the same thing. There's something different happening. What, what you see happened with me, which is a very clear case of like, this motherfucker really felt like a girl. God bless. That is not the same thing as my entire family is going to transition now, including my child, my minor child. It's a very different thing. Um, I don't know what to say really, other than it makes me want to die. Not literally, but you know, it's like so depressing. It's like, wow, like, wow. <laughs> the other depressing side of the coin of the totally not social contagion trans coin is the detrans side, obviously detransitioners. And uh, what I've said from the beginning is that lawsuits are going to be what changes everything. I remember at the top of the year, I said that you know, I was hearing through the pipeline, maybe a few birdies, that 2023 was going to be the year of detrans lawsuits. And what we saw in Europe was all these countries that were hacking off little girls' breasts before the U.S., right? The OGs of the uh, modern day lobotomy for children. The thing that changed all that and what made them all start, you know, we're sending all the guidelines for puberty blockers, surgery, hormones, was lawsuits. Because what do people respond to in any capitalist country? Money. Hi. Cash. Cha-ching, bitch. Uh, and, you know, lawsuits scare off especially plastic surgeons because, you know, as someone who's had maybe a few plastic surgeries, maybe a lot of them, 
or not surgeries actually, I only had one surgery, but a lot of things done is that you sign a pretty lengthy waiver, right? You sign a lot. You basically tell them if you make me croak from whatever you're doing to my face and our body that I can't do anything. However, you know, it is one of the still, even with all that, it is still one of the most, you know, it's a profession with a lot of liabilities, obviously. And word of mouth is what has built that entire industry up. And I know this based on, you know, when you do get a surgery, a plastic surgery of any kind, if you have, you know, two brain cells rubbed together, you're doing research. And that research means Googling surgeons and picking which surgeon's right for you and looking at their results, reading Yelp reviews. Maybe not Yelp. There's other websites like for plastic surgeries, but, you know, just reading customer reviews because it is you know, even though we act like these, you know, trans kids transitioning is some like spiritual event, it is a monetary transaction and they are paying for, you know, a surgery. So you can look at that. And, you know, I get people in my DMs every day asking me what surgeons I go to, what do I recommend? You know, I've even had like a straight man ask me like recently where I got my nose done because he wanted to get his nose done. I was like, wow. I mean, that's a first. Like usually it's trans women and women asking me where I go to get surgery, but Hi, it's a new day. Um, <laughs> funny coming for me. So I know that it's built on word of mouth. And detransitioners, unfortunately, you, know, you can have the word detransitioner in the title of what they are. But what they really are is a botched patient, is a patient that is unhappy with the results of a service they paid for. That makes surgeons run away. Instead of leaning in to help you in your time of need when you realize, oh my God, I made a mistake. I physically altered my body and I regret it. You know, they run away from that because that's ultimately a bad review. That's ultimately a bad story about what they did. And again, word of mouth is so important in that industry. But, uh, you know, the lawsuits are going to change everything. So Texas detransitioner, can't talk today. Texas detransitioner sues doctors for $1 million over botched surgery. That'll do it, sis. The Millie, that'll do it, right? So her story, to sum it up here, uh, she received her surgery at 17, demented. She says doctors behave more like ideologues than medical professionals, 100%. This has been my experience with every doctor and, you know, surgeon and person who does trans anything that I've encountered. They, they, they do behave like ideologues. Um, some more than others, right? A lot of the ones that have been in the game for a long, long, long time don't act like that because they were operating on, you know, they were doing this stuff back when trans really meant something, when there was, you know, not all of this happening. But, you know, especially a lot of the newer ones, you walk in and, what are you, a shaman, sir? Why are you talking to me about how my spirit is going to feel free after I take these drugs and do this surgery? Are you a religious leader or are you a doctor who should be informing me of the objective, like, realities of these things I'm about to undergo in the physical realm? in the real world right so yeah the ideologue thing i relate to she says her autism depression anxiety and other comorbidities were not taken into account and she was fast-tracked into surgery wow so if this story doesn't sound like every other d trans story i've heard and that really tells you something right there because it's one thing for these hoes to deny that detransitioners exist because they try to do that they're like it's not even really a thing right so you you can you know Put your demented, probably colored hair, head in the sand for as long as you want about D-trans people being real. And you can claim it's not happening, but uh, it is. And uh, the thing that really, for me, validates that it is happening in record numbers and it's very serious is that all their stories are so parallel. It's kind of like when someone comes out against someone in Hollywood, a predator, right? When all their stories kind of sound the same. Oh, such and such had a thing for big toes on the right foot, just the big toe and just the right foot, and all these women are saying it, that might hold some weight, right? So for me, it's like, yeah, they always talk about how they were fast-tracked through, you know, the the doctors were behaving like it was, you know, some sort of like gender studies class, and that they had other comorbidities that were not taken into account, such as body issues, which are commonly misunderstood as trans issues this is a very common thing this is something i had to learn you know the difference between body dysmorphia and gender dysphoria i had to come to realize that and figure that out as an adult when i transitioned i never anticipated 
like being attractive afterwards. Like that was something that came after that almost caught me by surprise. I was like, oh, so now there's a whole other set of like things I have to think about. It's not just like transitioning, getting to the point of like walking into a room and people thinking I'm a girl, but it's now female beauty standards placed on me, right? Because as much as a lot of y'all want to call me a man, you sure place female beauty standards on me, right? So that has been a thing, you know, working on camera, you know, I've developed little complexes about certain things and I've tweaked things and done that. I always said, like things like getting my lips done and filler and Botox and all that, that was not like part of my transition. That was working on camera and changing things and having stigmas and like, this is the thing about that y'all don't want to talk about. I remember when I had no lips and I first came up on camera and all the comments were like, oh my God, you have no lips. Oh my God, the white girl with no lips is talking about this. And then I get my lips done and it's like, oh my God, Blair's going crazy with getting her lips done. Well, maybe if you hoes didn't give me a, a lip complex. Um, I don't have one anymore, actually. I know a lot of y'all still say my lips are too big, but I actually love how they look now. And uh, I don't go for the natural look, but let me not go on a tangent because the point is I had to learn that body dysmorphia was different than gender dysphoria. And I had to do that post-transition, actually. And I had to do that as an adult. So the idea that a child, a young girl who is developing and like any other young girl has, you know, feelings about that and issues with that and, you know, body issues, but, you know, anorexia, bulimia, like all these things are so common in that age group. And she has to differentiate between that and other body issues like gender dysphoria. Right that's totally normal. She should totally be expected to tell the difference. Demented. I think part of the problem also, this is going to sound dumb, but like sometimes the dumbest and most simple answer is like the truth. I think a lot of the reasons people get body dysmorphia and gender dysphoria, they conflate them is because the words sound the same. <laughs> like I know that seems like an oversimplistic way to look at this, but like it's not lost on me that dysmorphia sounds a whole like a whole lot like dysphoria and people are going to think those are the same thing. Even people in my life who like are very aware of what gender dysphoria is and have even like had like in-depth talks with me about it will sometimes say like gender dysmorphia and I'm like, that's not a thing. It's gender dysphoria. And then there's body dysmorphia, which is what everyone kind of goes through, right? Like, so... I think that's part of the reason. But anyways, moving on. She also says that she has permanent disfigurement and profound psych psychological scarring. I mean, yeah. Wow. Like, I would assume that's the least of what you go through is psychological scarring. Like, Jesus. You should sue just based on that. You don't even got to go in the, you know, list of all the physical things that happen to you. We can stop at psych psychological scarring. These hoes played with your spirit, your being, and damaged you. And they're going to hell for that. And they should pay for that with money as well. And then hell in the afterlife. She says that they negligently supervised her problematic recovery. Right. Just like I said earlier, you know, these surgeons, they actually run away from you during recovery. I have a distinct memory. I talked about this on the Roseanne podcast. When I got my face and my boobs on at the same time, tell me why they put me in a wheelchair 30 minutes after waking up from like a seven hour surgery and pushed me into an Uber and sent me to my hotel right off the bat. And I was just in an Uber bandaged up. I don't even remember actually being in the Uber. I'm telling this story because my mom was with me and she recounts this because right out of surgery, out of anesthesia, you don't remember anything. Was I really ready to be on the streets? Out on the scene with the gangster lean? Recovering from that with my whole head cut open? Probably not. So when you're in recovery, that's when they're the most liable for things. So that's when they distance themselves the most from you, these surgeons. So there's another uh, lawsuit, another big Millie that this other one's suing for, thank God, who says that she was transitioned as a vulnerable teenager, right? I mean, there's really no point in life other than teenage where you're more vulnerable. I mean, Wow. She struggles with anorexia and body issues, but when she stumbled into trans groups online, she became convinced these issues meant she was actually a boy. Again, same story every time. Oh, they found the trans groups, and then the trans groups that have all these little phrases like crack in the egg. Y'all say crack in the egg when you make someone trans. That's a little phrase they use in the little websites. Oh, we cracked an egg today. 
or some demented shit like that. I don't know. Don't quote me, bitch, but something like that. Something about eggs, which y'all don't have because you're men. Um, but they find these groups and then all of a sudden they think that they're trans because these people think that if you even suspect it, that means you are. That a two-year-old must know. No. No. The concept of people being wrong with their self-diagnosis is a thing. And then you have surgeons who have ideological and financial incentives to just tell you you're correct even when you're not. Because no one's even ever sued for this shit before, before now. Duh. See, once they start suing, then y'all are going to be a little more skittish about putting that 14-year-old on, on who identifies as a cat on hormones, hopefully. Bitches. Her lawsuit notes that her now unwanted body hair is uncontrollable, permanent disfigurement, uh, with her breasts gone, and she has psych psychological damage, of course. And, uh, you know, I, I just find it crazy how these people are treated. I mean, they're treated as if they're pariahs, as if they're lepers, as if they have COVID and they're coughing on you. Detransitioners. It's like, I've never understood that. I know that they poke a huge hole, so you think, in your narrative, trans activists, about, like, transitioning being a good thing. But, like, that's only because you're a simpleton. You're simple-minded, Similarly with how people get defensive when they hear about the trans social contagion, they're such black and white thinkers and such troglodytes, such NPC assholes that they think that when people say there's a trans social contagion, they think that they, they're making a statement that the entire thing is a social contagion. No, no. It's a social contagion based off something that is real, right? Not that hard to understand. Same with the D-trans stuff. Just because people are saying, hey, there's people regretting these surgeries, especially as kids, why do you have to feel threatened like that's somehow a statement on you and your transition? Let's get a little more secure. Put our head up a little straighter. Get a little more confidence and not feel threatened by other people's pain and other people's stories. Like when I hear people, when I hear their pain and their stories and, you know, traumatic things they've gone through, I lean in and I lean in and listen because I'm a human being baby girl, I care, right? Y'all hear people's pain and you think it's somehow a statement about you or a threat to you? Sit up a little, get some confidence and understand it, has, it doesn't affect you at all. I've never understood why I'm supposed to feel threatened about my transition because Jane Doe over here got a surgery that she regrets. I would love to make it harder for people to regret trans surgeries because that actually validates them in the first place. In terms of people are going to take the whole trans shit a little more seriously if they don't observe the objective reality that they're being canted out like Skittles to kids who also like Skittles and who you can wave a magic wand in their face and they're transfixed like a cat, right? It's just crazy. Listen, speaking of crazy, it's time to react to woke TikToks. These ones look disgusting. I always look at the thumbnails first. I'm like, okay, let's look at the freaks. And I don't say freak even just in their appearance. I mean, yeah, like most of them like look like freaks and that's just, would you like to argue? But also it's less about that for me. Everyone's like, oh, Blair's always focused on looks. For me, it's about, I believe in the mind-body connection. I believe in the mind, body, spirit connection. So I believe that ugliness, that dementedness, the spirit of the troglodyte exists within you. It's not on you, it's in you, but then it becomes on you because it comes out. It's kind of like, and people don't understand this. It's like people who have been through a lot of trauma in their life, People who have lived really hard lives, they tend to have really hard lines right here because they spend their line, their lives. I can't make the face have too much Botox, but you know, they, they'll have those lines there because they're always scowling. They're scowling their entire life because maybe they really were going through a lot and had a lot of reasons to be mad, but that affects your physical. So there's one example right there. So I believe when you're a freak on the inside, it's only a matter of time until it comes out. But anyways, let's, let's just start watching. If you're cis, I want you to message the trans person in your life and ask them what is one thing that you can do to lighten their 
low this week. Whether that be grocery shopping, folding laundry, doing dishes, ask the trans people in your life if there's a task or something that you can offer them to help with the burden that we're carrying because we're having to deal with all of this stuff right now. Hi. Welcome to life. Oh, you're dealing with stuff? You're dealing with stuff? Do you have issues? Do you have problems? Do you have life circumstances that can be inconvenient like every other person? Clap if you think she should suffer. Like I'm convinced that these narcissists think that no one else has issues, that no one else has problems, that no one else has any hardship in life besides them, which is why they prioritize their shit over every other group at all costs. Here's the thing. If y'all wanna come do my laundry, feel free. Y'all wanna wash my car, do it, babe. And if y'all wanna pay my bills, I'll even go out to dinner with you or something. Just kidding, I'm not that bitch. I'm that bitch, but I'm not that bitch. Do not message me asking what you can do for me during this hard time. I'm going through it like everyone else is going through it. And me being trans is not a handicap. Doesn't mean I'm like retarded. Doesn't mean I can't walk. Doesn't mean I can't brush my teeth. So don't message me this condescending shit allies talking about what can I do for you? I don't need you. I've gotten here myself. I'm a one bitch army. Hi. Hello. The world's been trying to take me out since I came out of the womb. I have had everything in life try to kill me and I'm still here. So I don't need you. No, don't need you. Shout out to you though. You can wash my car. We'll say that. I do need y'all for that. Camp counselor discusses how he turned his campers into communists. Speaking of viruses. I was a camp counselor for one week and turned an entire cabin of 13 year olds into leftists. Here's how. It started on day one when the kids of their own volition decided to have an election to see who would be president of the cabin. They had me track votes anonymously and I may have broken a tie in favor of the obviously queer kid. Another kid who was weirdly obsessed with Russian history then asked if he could be Mikhail Gorbachev to the cabin, to which I said, I don't think so. Uh, you could be Karl Marx though. He was thrilled. The kids then, somewhat clumsily, started discussing the merits of their communist government. It probably would have ended there, but on day two, the president told me that he had trouble sleeping the night before and asked me if I had anything to read. I had exactly one book with me, The ABCs of Socialism. This kid read the entire book in one night. The next day, another kid asked for it, and then another. By day four, Karl Marx proposed that our cabin cheer be the communist cabin, where everyone is equal, and everyone agreed. Call the police. We need to call the police. So, kids are susceptible enough to be indoctrinated into a complex political position, but can't be convinced they're trans. They always know that for sure. But they can be given a political identity within one week by a camp counselor. You're going to hell for that, sir. And you need to do some soul searching as like deep within that spirit of yours. Like I've been talking about, it comes out. It's coming out based on how, okay, it's coming out. You need to figure out why you are proud of yourself for indoctrinating the stupidest kind of person, a child. A child who is the most vulnerable to being indoctrinated. See, it would have been a flex, baby boy, if you came up on here talking about how I got my entire college class to become communist. Or you know what, that's not even a flex because college people, people in college are always commies. But I don't know, like how I went to an AA meeting and turned everyone to a communist, that's a flex, you're persuasive. Wow, you convinced a bunch of little kids and gave them a reward system that showed that if they identify as a communist, that they're getting good favor with the authority figure, the camp counselor, the person they're forced to be around for the next few weeks. Wow, you are so, your, your mind is just so powerful. Disgusting. All right, 
TikToker goes on unhinged rant. <laughs> I love what people, I love the word unhinged. It's just so funny. Against white people calling them stinky, evil, and bleach demons. Go off, bitch. Let's see. Okay. This isn't like full shade towards you. I just see a lot of comments like this, and this was the most recent one, so I'm just responding to this one. When white people say shit like this, it isn't the serve they think it is. Like, you're a part of the problem. Fix your people, bro. Like, when white people are like, I'm white, and white people do suck. Yeah, you're probably a part of those said white people, so do something about it. The fuck? Also, I hate when white people try to validate me. Like, they're literally like, I'm white, but I agree. Bro, I don't know if you noticed, but I don't need validation from white people. Like, that's the last thing I need in my life. Like, I feel like white people always try, but they miss. Like, and I feel bad for y'all. Not that bad, though, because your ancestors suck and you're stinky and evil. But bad enough where I want to call you out and tell you not to leave comments like this because it's crusty. Anyways, for all the bleach demons willing to learn, I see you. You're not as bad as the rest. First of all, I'm sending you a cease and desist for using the word crusty because that's what I'm going to use for you, and that's my line. You're absolutely busted, crusted, and disgusted. Don't forget, disgusted. It's amazing to me how people just choose to adopt this toxic mindset of obsession with race, you know, convincing themselves that they can hate an entire race of people and not somehow be exactly what they claim to hate. Congrats, ho, you became the demon that you were fighting against. Isn't that interesting? Everything just comes full circle, right? I see a lot of pain in her. And again, that comes out. But I do have to say, you know, one of the biggest lies that my generation was ever told and I'm talking about the generation of people who really started growing up in sort of like not the post-racist era because there will always be racist, but the time in American history where we kind of got it together, right? We kind of got it together in the early 2000s, late 90s, where we're like, you know what? People of every race deserve every equal opportunity, right? There was a lie that was told during that time that still seems to persist based on uh, this unhinged hoe running her mouth, which is that only white people can be racist. Now, if you've ever stepped foot in the real world and talked to, see, that's the thing. Y'all, if you believe that lie, you're really the one who has no diverse friend group. You're the white lib who only hangs out with white people but claims you hang out with black people. You're the person who only hangs out with your race if you believe only white people can be racist because as someone who grew up in a half Mexican, half white family and community, I never heard any racist shit coming out of my wife's uh, side of the family's mouths, but the Mexican side of my family, hi. They said a lot of crazy-ish about race, about other races. Hi, you ever live in a city and you see all the, the anti-Asian hate crimes that they have to, for their own narrative, pin on white supremacy, but we all see who's actually committing all those anti-Asian hate crimes in San Francisco? Like, right. Any race is capable of hating any race. And that is the definition of racism. So I don't know who you're calling racist other than the mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the most busted of them all? You. Baby girl. Work on yourself. Heal. You're broken. I see it all over you. You're broken. Get it together. Fix yourself and fix your face, okay? Dietitian. <laughs> tells followers to eat whatever they want whenever they want because eating three meals a day is rooted in white supremacy did i not just say that y'all could look at an orange piece of paper and call it white supremacy and now eating three meals a day is racist okay okay uh go off karen the day thing breakfast lunch and dinner is from colonialism and white supremacy as if we didn't have enough good reasons to stop letting external cues tell us how to feed ourselves and start listening to our internal cues, here's another one. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate when crusty old white men tell me what to do with my life or especially tell me what to do with my body. So eat what you want, when you want. There are no rules. Start listening to what your body is telling you. You're white, bitch. You think you're earning any cool points? 
come up and talking about crusty old white men telling much you do what to eat. First of all, who even associates eating three meals a day with crusty old white men? What crusty old white men are telling you to eat three meals a day? It's bizarre. You're bizarre. You're not earning any cool points. And uh, the idea that you should just trust your internal cues about when and, and what you should eat, a lot of y'all's internal cues are the reason you're fat. Like she's huge, but she's so beautiful. She's a mammoth, of course. And a lot of y'all's internal cues and succumbing to every little emotion you feel is the reason why your body is looking like that. And it's not just about looks, it's about health and being physically capable. And like, you know what I mean? It's like, no, you're a dietitian telling people to just follow their heart with what they want to eat. Okay. Again, fix yourself. You're broken and it's coming out. Next. Oh God. Ugh. The theme of this is that the demon comes out and you can see it. Hi. Am I wrong? See, maybe up until this point in the episode, you were like, you know what? Loving what Blair has to say, but why is she bringing looks into it? There's no correlation from being a demon on the inside and it coming out on the outside. Hi, meet this person. They'd like a word about their breast milk. Male starts a GoFundMe to buy pumps so he can lactate and offer babies transgender milk. Can't believe I just said that word, that phrase. Has life really dwindled down to this? I think it has. Okay, <laughs> transgender milk. He says that he's always wanted to lactate. Let's see what this crackhead has to say. I've always wanted to be able to lactate. And mm. today, my doctor, after my EKG results, said that she's feeling confident enough to start me on this medication, Reglin. And it has some serious side effects, but I'm only going to be taking it for two weeks, up to three weeks possible. Um, so within two weeks, I should be lactating. The rest is on me. I'm going to have to pump and keep a supply. This is the tough part. I have one pump. I need two pumps. And I'm, the, the amount of lactate, the amount of pumping that I have to do to lactate is going to require a better pump than what I got. I mean, I have electric pump. Find me a church. I've done everything everybody else wants to do. Find me a church to go to. I need peace in my heart. I need it now. Bring me. You know, in a world that made even a drop of sense, this would just be considered a crackhead. This would, be, would just be considered a sea urchin who, you know, God bless them. God bless the sea urchins, right? Hate that you're in that position. What you don't do is give the sea urchins a medical plan to lactate and feed children. This is a crackhead. You know it. I know it. Your body knows it. If you saw this person on the street, you would do, you, you would, you know, do a few things to avoid coming into too close of contact with them. Maybe you're crossing the street. Oh, I can walk on that side of the street today. That's fine. Oh, it's a block detour for me to do that. That's fine. Because that's a crackhead and a quite scary looking one at that. But because we live in this world that doesn't make a drop of sense, you have a doctor helping this person lactate to feed children. Hmm. We need God. Can you come back now, Jesus? I don't know if I really believe in you. But now would be a good time. Literally, it's a crackhead. Like what? Oh, let, let's let this person breastfeed. Let's let this man breastfeed children. 
Like, that's a whole other layer. It's like, first of all, doctors are transitioning this person who's clearly on crack. So that's already medical malpractice. And now you're on a whole separate medical journey to lactate and feed children. To transfer that crack to a baby who will, then, who will be, get it from a male's nipples. We're living in hell. Hope you enjoy the ride. Australian girl is triggered that there are so many American flags in America. Okay. Let's hear you out. Let's, let's, hear, let's hear her out. I'm just going to say it. There are too many American flags. Like they're on houses, they're on cars, saw them on couch cushions. Like, I don't know who's making these American flags, but they'd be making a bloody fortune. And like, you're the only country that I know that does this. Like, the only time I think I've ever seen an Australian flag is like on the Harbour Bridge. Could not tell you what it looks like. Like, I know it's like blue, it's got some stars on it. You know, I really relate to you because I couldn't tell you what the fuck the Australian flag looks like either. Because I don't really care. Do you have a lot of flags? Yes. Do other countries seemingly not have a lot of flags? Yes. Well, guess what, bitch? We're the greatest country on the motherfucking planet. And we're going to do it like that. Right? You can leave, baby girl. You can leave. You don't have to be here. In fact, we would prefer you not be here complaining about our flag. You will not bring your ghetto here. You will not bring your ghetto here. Like, that's why y'all get, we're locked in your homes. Really locked in your homes. Because the lockdowns here made the Australian ones look. <laughs> that's why y'all had literally no rights during all of COVID. Because y'all don't really have much of a fight in you to defend your freedom. We do. And the flag is just a little reminder of that, right? Because when I see the flag, I actually see like, no, we're, we're still free. That's not China's flag, so we're still free. And I'll take as many reminders of that as I can get. I don't really care. So book a flight. Go back. You're not wanted. Bye, babe. Non-binary LGBTQ activist demands that we respect her. <laughs> if you have to demand respect, you are like highly disrespectable. Like I feel like I don't ever go anywhere and just get disrespected. <laughs> and I feel like if I did, it would like partly be on me. Like, I don't know. Like, why are you just getting disrespected everywhere, sis? That we respect her and other non-binary people by stopping she used gendered honorifics. Why do they always look like this? Blair, stop bringing up looks. Stop bringing up what's right in my face. If anyone's under any misconception that I scroll and just choose the freakiest looking people, no. No. You just look up these topics and th these are the people talking about it, right? Okay, so let's see. So there's a conversation that goes around a lot where people who habitually use uh, gendered honorifics like sir or ma'am ask very kindly what a good gender neutral replacement for that would be and the most common answer from people like me who don't like gendered words applied to us is learn to drop the honorific because most of us don't like to be put in that situation in a quick interaction with a stranger and the asker will protest that they don't feel like they're respecting people without the honorific friends I see you really trying and I understand that you've been conditioned really hard to use this kind of language but I have to ask, who is the respect for in this scenario? Because we're telling you the best way to respect us is to not use an honorific. So she is saying not just to not use those for her. I don't know if y'all caught that. She's saying the solution to this problem in its entirety is for everyone to stop using them entirely and just change it from the language. Again. Maybe instead of a transgender diagnosis, these motherfuckers should get a narcissist diagnosis. Who is narcissistic enough to think the English language should be changed for them? You're going to hell for that. You're going to hell just for the glasses alone. I mean, wow. <laughs>
you're not giving what you think you're giving. Right. You're not giving anything at all. You're the queen of giving us nothing. She just doesn't have the vernacular that she thinks she possesses. Somebody lied to her several times and told her that she was fly, hot, and sexy, and beautiful. And she's nothing like that. She's nothing of the sort. You give us nothing. I just watched a 45 second video of you and you gave me nothing but a headache. So again, you're going to hell for that. Listen, that is it for this episode, you guys. I love you. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel as well as my main channel. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Rate this podcast on Spotify and I will see you next time. Bye.